I can think of a few other places that I would uh, I would rather be than in my own church uh, this morning on on Father's Day. A uh, few other places I'd rather be than here, besides there, uh, teaching about church history. Um, church history is is something that uh, that's vital. It's important. It's something that I didn't know a lot about, which is probably why I I uh, enjoyed learning about it so much. When I went to seminary, um, when I came to Christ at 24, I didn't really, I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know the difference between the Old and the New Testament. And so then when I went to seminary at 30, I surely didn't know anything about, about church history. And so I learned a lot from watching God work in the lives of, of people. And so that gave me a love for church history and, and then uh, became a graduate assistant for the for the professor there, and then it's kind of been a lifelong, uh, lifelong pursuit. Um, as Medley said, I have the the privilege of teaching it at uh, at Expositors, besides pastoring it at, at Timberlake. It's not unusual for people not to know a lot about about church history. I mean, the average person's knowledge about church history goes back about about ninety years to whatever their pastor's pastor knew, and so. This morning, I don't know how much you know about uh, church history, um, but hopefully when you leave today, you'll be encouraged and maybe even uh, desirous of, of reading some more, specifically about the, the English Reformation, which is what we're going to cover this morning in the life of, of John Rogers. And I picked John Rogers because most people don't know a lot about, about him. Um, it, it, it's not about dates or events that happened a, a long time ago in a, in a faraway place. It, it, the church history is actually the record of the hand of God working in the lives of, of people and men. In particular, God working in His church. As, uh, if you were here part of the men's conference, we talked about how Jesus makes a promise to build His church and He's continuing to do that. And that work didn't stop. Uh, at the end of the book of Acts, obviously, that kept going. It didn't stop at the, at the, at the end of, of Revelation. Jesus is still building his church, and he's been doing that for 2,000 plus, plus years. And so church history actually gets you, gives you the, you know, the, the, the privilege of, of, of watching that. Um, and you also get to see people's lives from beginning to end. I mean, one of the problems in modern church, uh, evangelicalism, whatever term you want to use, is an individual getting enamored with somebody who's, who's young uh, or you know, in their 30s and have, hasn't lived long enough, and then they, they crash and burn. In church history, you see someone's the start of their life, and you also see the end. You can see the good parts and the bad parts, their theology, how that worked out, and so that's helpful as, as well. And when you actually stand back and look at church history from, from the apostles and the prophets who laid the foundation of the church, and then Ephesians 4 that was handed off to missionary evangelists and pastors and teachers, when you, you watch that handoff take place all the way up till today, what you'll find is a clear stream of doctrines flowing from Christ to the apostles all the way up to what you believe today. And you'll watch the church and church history getting to one side of those doctrines or the other and correct. I mean, the pendulum is always swinging and it's always, it's always correcting, but God is preserving his truth and his truth that, that, that comes out of the passages of, of Scripture. Um, it's about God fulfilling his sovereign plan. Church history is is actually watching God's decree un unfold. I I Isaiah 46, 9 declares, Remember the former things uh, long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things which have not yet been done, saying, My purpose will be established and I will accomplish all of my good pleasure. And that verse stretches beyond the history that we have in the Bible. It goes from creation to to the consummation of the ages and everything in, in between. And it declares that God has determined history. Um, I am God, and I declare the end from the beginning. It declares that history is linear. Um, it has a beginning and it has an ending, praise God. And it's not circular. History doesn't repeat itself, as you'll hear the world uh, say quite often. It has a design. It has a purpose. My purpose shall be established, God says. I will accomplish all my good pleasure. And God is bringing a well-defined plot to its appointed 
consummation. It's, a, it's appointed uh, end. It, it, it's also uh, doxological. I mean, history glorifies God. God will be glorified at the end of history in, in Revelation 21. And, and so what you get whenever you study church history is you get to see all of that in the lives of people, in the lives of, uh, or through Christ's church, I should say. And, and that's what we're going to what we're going to look at this morning. We're, we're going to look at one of the most significant moments in, in history, which was part of the Protestant Reformation. Um, Steve Lawson, in, uh, in the opening series on the, on the Reformation to, to Grace Church, quoted Philip Schaff, who's a, a great church historian. He said, second to the introduction of Christianity, the Protestant Reformation is the greatest event in history. I mean, that that's a pretty, pretty strong statement. I mean, Lawson now, not, not Schaff, said, the Reformation was a turning point. It marked the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of modern times. And every one of us in here has been affected uh, by, by the Reformation. I mean, Western civilization is largely a product of it. You've heard of the Protestant work ethic, which uh, built Europe uh, and uh, brought countless men and women to America to, to prosper. I mean, the Reformation was the wind in the sails of the, the Mayflower that brought the Puritans to our shores, and the founding of our country was actually an outgrowth of the, of the Reformation. I mean, if you would go to Geneva and gaze at the Reformation wall, you'll see four men standing in the middle, which is the picture that you often see. But, but off to both sides of those men are... are, are are murals of, uh, of historical events, things that led up to the Reformation and things that led out of it. I mean, the four men there, uh, uh, William Farrell, which is a great name, by the way, uh, John Calvin, John Knox, and Theodore Beza, th the four men in the middle of the Reformation wall. And, and to the right and left, as I said, are these, are these murals uh, of movements leading up to them and, and away with, with with smaller statues that, that, that are there. And just to the right is, is John Knox. And there's a statue of, uh, or just to the right of John Knox, is a statue of Roger Williams, a Puritan, who founded the, the first Baptist church in, in America. And, and next to him is a, is a mural of, of the Pilgrim Puritans uh, establishing the Mayflower Compact. And the point is, here's the event, and, and here's what flows out of that, that, that event. Um, the most obvious and the most significant impact of the Reformation was the reclamation of the Bible and the gospel itself, which had been muted and obscured through the evils of Roman Catholicism. Um, I know you've heard of the five solas. You're in a, you're in a, you're in a good church. But, but Geneva had its own Reformation motto, which was post tenebras lux, which was after darkness, light. That's emblazoned in a wood inlay in Calvin's church in Geneva. In, in Geneva. And um, that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, uh, a man who helped spread light through the truth of the gospel in England after a lot of darkness there. And there was still uh, quite a bit of darkness that was mingled in. And he actually pays with his very life for sharing that uh, that, that truth. But I want to start by looking at a passage of, of Scripture. So I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you would. 1 Timothy chapter 4. So we're going to start by looking at Scripture, and then we're going to see how this Scripture is illustrated by a man in church history. And... Uh, in, in this case, even died for it, and then we're going to apply it to our own lives. That's kind of what's in front of us. So you're going to get a Bible lesson, an illustration of a faithful man's life, and then personal application for your, your own life, if I am successful in what I, what I hope to do. So let's read uh, 1 Timothy 4, verses 11 through, through 16, if you would. 4, 11 through 16. It says, prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through the prophetic utterance, 
with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident before all. Pay close attention to yourself and your teaching. Preserve or persevere in these things. And as you do, this will ensure salvation both for yourself and also for those who hear you. Let me pray before we, we launch. Heavenly Father, I do, do ask that you would help me to be helpful um, to your saints, people that you love, and therefore uh, in Christ I love. You shed your blood for them, and so you want them to be helped and equipped, and I greatly desire to be to do that this morning and bring you glory in all of uh, my weakness, and uh, I pray that in that they would be edified and Jesus would be glorified. In his name we pray, amen. I mean, this is, a, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture, probably. It begins in verse 1, talking about the latter days, what, what we're going to find in the, in the latter days. And this section that we just read also contains a verse that young preachers like to take out of context. Let, let no one despise my youth, is what they, they normally say, but it says, let no one despise your youth. And of course, they leave out the exemplary conduct part, which removes the suspect of their inexperience. But 1 Timothy 4, in 1 Timothy 4, Paul is giving some interest, uh, instruction to his young protege about a biblical ministry. And verse 6 actually provides the theme of this, this whole section. Look at verse 6. It says, In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. You'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus. And so Paul Paul's concern for Timothy is that Timothy would be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And what follows are instructions about how to do that, how to be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And so this section provides an excellent assessment of a biblical ministry and therefore a measure of every church and, and every servant of the church. And Paul is explaining to Timothy how to be a faithful or literally good servant of Jesus. And he does that by giving characteristics and commands that follow this statement and uh, those who would fulfill this, this charge. And some see 12 here. I, I think that there's probably eight uh, up to our verse. And he, he says, a faithful, ministry, uh, a faithful minister alerts the flock to error in, in, in verse 6. Um, he says, you'll be a good servant constantly nourished on the words of faith and in sound doctrines, in pointing out these things to the, to, to the brethren. Uh, a good minister focuses the flock on, on, on sound doctrine. He turns away from secondary matters in, in, in verse 7. Have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for, for old women. And he disciplines himself unto godliness in verse seven through, uh, through, verses 7 through 9. Um, it's the uh, bodily discipline is only for little profit, but, but, but godliness. Uh, he works hard in verse 10. For this we labor and strive. Um, he proclaims God's message with authority in verse 11. Prescribe and teach these things. He maintains biblical fidelity in verse 13. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture and exhortation and teaching. He, he doesn't neglect his calling in verse 14. Do not neglect the, the spiritual gift within you. And he is given to biblical practice in verse 15. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident before all. Paul says, if you want to be a good minister of Christ, your life should be followable and your doctrine faithful. It's probably a good way to summarize everything that, that, that he says there. You should be a model of Christ in character and your mode should be careful communication of the, of the Scriptures, which he clearly highlights in these passages. And, and his theme in this entire section is a holy life and sound doctrine. If you really want to boil it down, that's what you're aiming at as a good minister, a holy life and, and sound doctrine. And he even describes how, how to have both of, uh, of those things. He says, you exemplify one, you model one, and you, you rivet the other. You rivet your doctrine to the Bible. And they both have a public nature. Look if you would at verse 12. He says, let, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity show yourself an example. So uh, to those who believe, to those in the church, I mean, you model you, you, by putting your life on display. 
for the sheep. And you're, you're an example to be observed. And your progress is evident before all, he'll go on to say in verse 15. And you, you give attention to the public reading of Scripture. So your life is public and what you do, your ministry is, is public. And that's followed by, by the expectation of teaching. Verse 16, it says, you pay close attention uh, to your doctrine so others may observe that as well. And notice the importance of the order that these things are listed in, in verse 13. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. So you can't have exhortation and teaching without the Scriptures publicly being publicly proclaimed. And the key word that I'm trying to emphasize is the, is the public part. It's, it's before the body of, of Christ. And the, the, there's, a, there's an article in the, in the original. So he, he, he says, give attention to the reading, uh, of course, of Scripture. So this is not your private Bible time. This is what happened in public worship. Um, and that's why your, your English Bible adds the word public implied by the definite article. So pastors, faithful ministers are to read, to exhort, and to teach. And they're to, con, they're to continually do that. They're to, give a, they're to give attention. It's a present active imperative verb followed by three nouns identifying what you give your attention to. And Paul has told Timothy to do it until he comes. And Timothy, his continual ministry, uh, minister, uh, ministry, sorry, uh, as a good servant uh, of Jesus, is centered around these three things, backed up by, by a life of character that displays them. So faithful pastors, faithful ministers, read the text, explain the text, call people to live out the text, and then model that in their, in their own life. But he calls on Timothy not to neglect his calling to this task in verse, verse 14. And then he says to give himself totally to the practice of those duties in verse, verse 15. Look at verse 14 and 15. I'm going somewhere with this, so hang with me. He says, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things and be absorbed in them all so that your progress will be evident before all. He says that because most men that God uses are reluctant leaders. Uh, if not, he thoroughly humbles them so he can make them that way. Um, I mean, they want Christ lifted up, not just themselves. And that makes a, a good minister. I mean, they don't, have to be conf they don't have to be coached into conviction. They hold the, the doctrines of the Bible with a death grip, but they don't want the limelight. Um, they don't want the glory of, of the mantle that comes with the mantle. And a, a man that Christ has, that has set Christ as king over his heart doesn't, doesn't want to be out front. And he's compelled in his heart that this is the task that he's been given by God. And so he has to be prodded toward that, that leadership sometimes. It's also why God typically uses them so greatly. He'll not share his glory with another and he gives grace to the humble. Now, people who have the humble hesitancy, though, sometimes need to be reminded to shake off that reluctancy and run on, and that indeed God has called them to, to, to this role. Verse 15, take pains with these things or practice these things. I mean, that's what Paul's telling Timothy. It's what he's doing. Be absorbed in these things. I mean, this is from God, not, not from you, Timothy, and you need to continue in these things so that your progress will be evident before all, which is a great verse. Not your perfection, but your progress. And so when, you're, when your life is modeled before others, they need to see growth. You know, not, it's direction, it's not perfection. And here are the twin imperatives that, that turn the command in a positive direction. Do not neglect the work and devote yourself to it. I mean, he says, take pains in these things. Be absorbed in them. I mean, what things? Well, it's everything on the list, but, but these things and the commands are specific. The, the verses 12 and 13, read the text, explain the text, call people to live out the text, and model that in your, in, in your life. You're not to neglect that work. You're not to be laissez-faire about it or have a questionable commitment to it. You're to pursue that with vigor. 
the word take pains or practice uh, means to attend carefully to, to something, to fix one's mind on it, to, to cultivate something into practice, to pick it up and turn it upside down and look at it and, and then to perform it. Uh, Philip Towner said the emphasis is on doing what has been set out. If you were using it related to a sermon, you would say you fully understand a passage and thoroughly apply it. Well, it's preparing and practicing. I mean, it's one thing to know about something. It's quite another thing to lay hold of that something with all of your faculties to the point that you can use it. And then it's another thing to actually do, actually do it. And Paul sees, says that, that, that you need to do that all the way through. I mean, I'm afraid what this implies is it's possible to know a lot about the Bible, but practice very little of, of what, what, what you know. And as my friend and I'm sure Smedley's friend Rick Holland said to me one time, appreciation for the truth is not application of the truth. You can appreciate the Bible, but not apply it. And when you do that, that's called a biblical integrity gap. And we all have one. I mean, a biblical integrity gap means that there's a gap between what we, what we know and what we practice. And again, we all have that gap. And our, our, our task, our goal is to constantly be closing that gap through, through even some of the things that we're told here in this, this passage. And you do that by being totally absorbed in the work, and, which is the second imperative, verse, verse 15. Be absorbed in them. Take pains. With these things, be absorbed in them. The word absorbed is not in the original. It just, it just literally reads, be in them. Be in it. Be after it. Downer again says it means to live and breathe these instructions and, and, and duties. And when you put both of those directions together, this is a call to be totally committed to biblical practice. You engage it with your mind, you practice it in your life, and it lays complete hold uh, of you because you've laid hold of it through those things. A biblical practice comes from biblical authority. I mean, knowing comes before doing. Uh, interpretation comes before application. Theology comes before methodology. Let me illustrate that. I mean, if you believe in uh, sola scriptura, then then your life is, is going to be based on the authority of Scripture. That means that you're going to solve your problems by looking to the Bible uh, alone, not philosophy or psychology or, or anything else, worldly thinking. I mean, if you, you believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture, then you're going to preach expositionally. So your theology is leading to your methodology. Because every word of God is breathed, and therefore the task is to say what God said and no more and, and nothing less. I mean, or if you don't believe that man is totally depraved, uh, if his will is not a slave to sin, like the Bible says, then you're going to think your job is in, in evangelism is to convince them with a good argument or, um, or something else instead of sharing the whole gospel so that the Spirit can do the work that He desires. I mean, methodology matters. Because methodology has theology standing behind it in the background. I mean, biblical fidelity comes before biblical practice. And you can't get those two things turned around. I mean, you must have biblical fidelity. You must have sola scriptura, or you have no authority for anything that, that you do. I shared with the men, I came to Christ whenever I was 24... And there's one thing that I knew instinctively. Governing my life based upon my opinions led me into a ditch. And I really didn't care what my opinion was. I wanted to know what did God say. So biblical fidelity. But believing in what the Bible says is not enough. You must do what the Bible says. And so that's where biblical practice comes in. You say, I haven't really thought about that, but it, but it makes some sense. And it sounds pretty serious if Paul wrote almost a whole chapter on it, and it is. But is it serious enough to die for? You're here this morning, and I'm going to ask you a, a rather forward question. I mean, what would you die for related to the truth? I'm not talking about beating your chest, but actually, what would you really die for? 
What's at the, the, the convictional core of, of your heart? Would you say the Bible? I mean, Brian, praise God, by God's grace, I don't have to be the Lord, I would have to give you that grace. I would die for the Bible, for the Word of God. I mean, what about the deity of Christ? Uh, you say, yes, Brian, if I was put to the test, again, by God's grace, if I had to choose death between denying the deity of Christ, I would die. How about the resurrection? Paul says without the resurrection, you don't have a, a gospel. Uh, okay, I would die for the resurrection. What about the practice of communion? You're going to take the Lord's table. We're going to take the Lord's table in the next service. Would you die for the practice of communion? If someone came in here in the next service and added the statement or said the statement before we were going to take the Lord's table that the real presence of Christ was active whenever we, we, we took the elements, would you be willing to die rather than accept that? Well, I want to tell you about a man who was first in a long line of Christians who died over the practice of communion. And he did so because he believed in theology. He believed in Solus Christus. Christ alone. And he understood the grievous error behind the, the, the Roman mass. And his name is, is John Rogers. And he's the first of the Marian martyrs. I mean, John Rogers and 400 plus others died because they knew this unbiblical practice um, was tied to an underlying belief. And that underlying belief denied the very gospel itself. I mean, in the words of the Book of Common Prayer, John Rogers knew that the doctrine of the Mass was, quote, a blasphemous fable and a dangerous deceit, which is still true today. It, it could be argued that the first Marian martyr was Lady Jane Grey, the nine-day queen, as, as she's called, which was her half-sister. But she, does, she died over a political move as she was thrust forward. John Rogers faced the fire for a refusal to deny biblical practice. And it's significant because he was the, the, the first. It was said that he opened the gate uh, to the fire for others to follow with joy, as you'll hear. And speaking of John Rogers, Steve Lawson said he paid the price that John Calvin, Martin Luther, and John Knox never paid. And he paid for his beliefs with his, with his life. Not just any death. He was burned at the stake. And it happened over a four-year rampage by the evilest queen to ever sit on, on England's throne from 1555 to 1558. Bloody Mary, as she was called, only reigned five years. Um, she died in 1558. But during those five years, she persecuted the church with white-hot intensity. In that short period of time, she burned no less than 288 Protestants at the stake specifically for their devotion to the Bible. And another hundred died imprisoned and impoverished, waiting on their turn. In 1555, there were 71 burnt. 1556, 89. 1557, 88 went to the flame. 1558, 40. And that's not even a complete list. I mean, there was a number, uh, there, there's a number that, that, was, that was never recorded. And her victims were some of the greatest people of the day, greatest men of the day. John Rogers was first on February 4th in Smithfield in London. Uh, Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer, John Philpott, 1556 Thomas Cranmer, 1557 Anne Ashton, 1557 also Mary Groves, two of 54 women who were torched for Christ. I mean, Mary, uh, who, who took the throne at age 37, continued to rage all the way up into her death. She died while on the throne, and the last week of her life, she burnt five Protestants. Can you imagine going into eternity, facing God, burning five people for the gospel? And these people weren't just pastors or, or, or theologians. There were plenty of those, like Cranmer and Ridley, who was a scholar and a pastor. There were over 200 lay people were tried, and the question was put to them, do you believe in the five solos of the Reformation? Will you recant? Do you deny the mass is the literal body and blood of Christ? If no, then you will be burned as a heretic. What say you? What's your answer? And these businessmen and mothers and farmers and even children, over 200 churchmen and women, would not capitulate. 
They denied for their, they, they, they died for their faith rather than deny it. And the first one to face the fire was, was John Rogers. It's hard to associate the English Reformation with, with one person. I mean, like you do with Germany, with Luther and, and uh, Geneva, with, with, with Calvin. But the life of a man named John Rogers actually exemplifies the reformers of England because he was the first in a very, in a very crucial time. I mean, John Rogers was a good minister of Jesus Christ, as Paul outlines in 1 Timothy 4. He was also a reluctant leader. He didn't even want his name on his translation work. Uh, um, so not to take away from Tyndale's work, who built on Wycliffe's work. And so he published his Bible under a pseudonym, the Thomas Matthews Bible. And he was unwaveringly committed to, to biblical practice with the goal that people could, could see his, his advancement. I and mean, he took pains in it, as Paul said. He, he was totally absorbed in providing the Word of God to others, and, and the God of the Word was evident in in his life. I mean, John Rogers was born around 1500 and he died in 1555. He was born in Derryden, England, in, in, in a parish of, of, uh, of Aston near Birmingham. He was educated in Pembroke Hall at Cambridge University. He graduated with his bachelor's in 1525 or 1526. There's some dates in church history that are, are fuzzy. He became a junior canon at Christ Church in Oxford. It was ordained as a priest in the Catholic Church. Almost all of the reformers actually started in the Catholic Church as priests because that's all there was until God opened the eyes of people and began to spread the Reformation. And then when they came out of that, their goal was to burn it to the ground because they knew how they had been deceived. We don't know a lot about his life until 1532 when he becomes the rector of Holy Trinity in Queen Hythe, London. But sometime after that, around 1534, he received an offer to be a chaplain to a group of British merchants in Antwerp, Belgium. And Roger says yes to this chaplain job. And it changed not only the course of his life, but the course of, the course of, uh, of England. I mean, they, they, they're these merchants that wanted someone to teach them the Bible and teach the Bible to... To their, to their workers, and they, they were all living in the same house, and they had a commercial venture, and this wasn't abnormal. You, you would often hire people of great estates, would hire clergy uh, to come and pastor, be the pastor over their, you know, their vast manors and, and workers, and Rogers goes and takes this task of, of preaching, and instead he, he encounters God's divine providence because there's there's another man who's living in the same house, and he's a guy named William Tyndale, which you've probably heard of him if you haven't heard of, of John Rogers. And the merchants there were Protestants, and they were businessmen, and they were using their, their, their wealth to help Tyndale. And Tyndale was, was hiding there, translating the Bible into English in the back room. And so when John Rogers meets William Tyndale, he's converted. I mean, John Rogers goes there. He's thinking he's going to teach the Bible as a Catholic priest, and God teaches him the gospel, and he becomes a follower of Christ. As I said, and when he does, I mean, he's all in. There's, there's, no, there's no turning back. And you've heard of John Wycliffe, who was the grandfather of the Reformation in England. Well, William Tyndale is called the father. He's also called the apostle of England, and Tyndale was a man zealous to fulfill what John Wycliffe had started, and he picked up where he, where he left off, and he loathed the Antichrist in Rome. I mean, his most famous line, Tyndale's most famous line, came whenever he was at an estate dinner with a Catholic priest who was a guest. It's just big, just imagine this big to-do, and all of these people, the largest state, and they're gathered, and, and he's there along with a Catholic priest, and at dinner... When everybody's talking around this large table, again, don't, don't think 10 or 12 people. I mean, I don't know how many were there. Think 50 or, or, or more. It's like a banquet. And so the priest brashly asserts at the dinner table, we would be better to be without God's laws than the Pope's. And an enraged Tyndale responded in front of everyone in the table. He can't contain himself. 
He says, I defy the Pope and all of his laws, and if God spares my life, I will cause the, the boy that drives the plow in England to know more of the Scriptures than the Pope himself in front of everyone. I mean, William Tyndale fulfilled that task and gave us our first English Bible. John Wycliffe translated the Bible into English. He did so from the Latin Vulgate. William Tyndale, who was the first one to translate it from Greek and Hebrew, and he did such a good job that when they translated the King James in 1611, large portions were just copied ver verbatim. In fact, about 85% of the King James Bible actually comes from, from his translation. So again, Steve Lawson said, whatever English Bible you have in your lap, regardless of the translation, you have it because of William Tyndale. And Tyndale was in the back room with a couple of assistants. While the King James Version had a whole translation committee and all the resources of the crown, Tyndale's there with just a couple guys grinding it out in the original languages to produce an English translation, and one of those assistants to Tyndale is John Rogers. And Rogers sees what Tyndale is doing, and he takes it upon himself to join the work. And so now Rogers becomes like a secretary or an assistant to Tyndale in his translation work. He's like a graduate assistant or a research assistant, like a paralegal related to, to Scripture. But there's something else that happens in, in Rogers' life, not only coming there and getting saved, but... But William Tyndale, after 12 years of being underground, translating the, the Bible, is betrayed, and he's arrested. And he's, he's betrayed by, by a man named Harry Phillips. He betrays Tyndale to regain his father's estate that, that he squandered in gambling. Profligate's son goes out, blows all of his dad's money and inheritance, and is embarrassed and wants to get it back, and he makes a deal with the Catholic Church. And so the Catholic Church promises him to restore all of, all of his money if he finds Tyndale, and he does. He's the Judas of the English Reformation. He befriends Tyndale. He lures him into a trap. He conspires and then leads Tyndale out of the house. He is even there when he's arrested. He even points him out, just like Judas. Tyndale was arrested. He was held for about a year and a half. Then he was martyred. He was strangled and then burned and blew up with gunpowder. And here were the actual crimes. Okay, I'm going to read to you what he was convicted of. These are the crimes of William Tyndale for, for, for that death. First, he maintains that faith alone justifies. Second, he maintains that to believe in the forgiveness of sins and to embrace the mercy offered in the gospel is enough for salvation. Third... He avers the human traditions cannot bind the conscience except where they neglect, uh, when, when, where, their, where their neglect might occasion scandal. Fourth, he denies the freedom of the will. Fifth, he denies that there is any purgatory. Sixth, he affirms that neither the virgin nor the saints pray for us in their own person. Seventh, he asserts that neither the virgin nor the saints should be invoked by us. I'm guilty as charged. How about you? Rogers hears about Tyndale's arrest, gathers up all of Tyndale's works, and flees with them. And when the men come back, they, they can't destroy Tyndale's work. And Rogers is now thoroughly convinced that he needs to take up the work, and there's a need for a Bible to be in the people's hands. And so Tyndale's New Testament was published in 1526, but the Old Testament was incomplete and up to this point, Tyndale has translated almost all of the, the, the New Testament and the Pentateuch and much of the Old. He, Ezra to Malachi is, is lacking, and there's some translation work that's needed to make it clearer. There's another guy named Miles Coverdale uh, who had helped Tyndale, and he's not a scholar, but he was driven to get an English Bible out, and he produces the Coverdale Bible which is surely better than nothing, but it needs a lot of work. And so the Coverdale translation from Latin is also deficient. And so John Rogers also takes the Coverdale Bible and works it over. Rogers is a Greek and Hebrew scholar uh, and, and translates like, like Tyndale, and he edits and he corrects, and uh, particularly the part uh, that Tyndale didn't finish, and he works over this complete translation, and Rogers turns it even into a better product than, than was there before. So 
what Tyndale started and Coverdale completed, Rogers improves. And beyond that, Rogers put some margin notes in, in, the, in the Bible, creating one of the first English study Bibles. He translated some notes from French scholars and put them there, and he also put articles in each of the books with key doctrines. There are over 2,000 notes that he puts there. One uh, church historian said, the Catholic Church feared Rogers' notes even more than the English translation because these notes and articles clearly explained the doctrines of the Reformation and the biblical gospel, and people had never heard that. Each page of the Bible had a summary of what was taught on the, on the page. I mean, imagine being in the middle of of the bubonic plague and all of the other things there, and you come to church and they speak in Latin, and you don't even have a Bible to be able to read. You don't even understand what they're saying, much less what, what they're saying in the sermon. And, and then when you go talk to the priest, they don't even give you the gospel. They tell you to do all this stuff, and it's dark. It's like the, one of the first commentaries of the, of, of the English, English Bible. Margin notes. This Bible was over a thousand pages. And so at some point, he left Antwerp and goes to Wittenberg to study under Luther. There he meets Melanchthon. And he goes on to a certain part of Germany and becomes a German pastor. And so there he meets his wife who's going to bear him, I'm sorry ladies, 11 children. And the final child is still on its mother's breast when he's burned at the stake. And he did all that translation work under the pseudonym Thomas Matthews, which is why it's called the Matthews Bible, and it was printed in 1536 in Paris and Antwerp by his wife's uncle, his wife Adriana. And he dedicates this Bible to the king of, of England, Henry VIII. And... Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, gets hold of the Bible and declares it the best English translation to date. And he secures a license from the king in 1537 to produce it in England. But Henry VIII, Henry VIII uh, has got some other issues. Six issues, to be exact, if you know anything about history. I mean, speaking of the English Reformation, Stephen Nichols said, Germany had Luther, Switzerland had Zwingli and, and Calvin, and England had a king. And it was Henry's issues that both assisted the Reformation and also produced its greatest threat, which was Bloody Mary. I mean, King, king Henry had six wives and many children, but, but the one who hated God in the Reformation was his daughter, Mary, Mary Tudor. She was born in 1516, and Henry's, Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragorn, or Aragon, I should say. There's my Lord of the Rings coming out. They had six children, and only Mary survived. Mary lived a quiet life as a royal princess until about 1527 when the king began to seek an annulment. Henry wants to get out of the marriage. And his greatest desire besides his lust was a male heir. And since Catherine had not produced one, he sought an annulment. And there was a problem, however. Catherine was the daughter of the Holy Roman Emperor. And he pressures the Pope to say no, no annulment. And since the Pope review, uh, refuses to grant an annulment, in 1533, Henry appointed Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who then dissolves the marriage, allowing him to marry Anne Boleyn. And then in 1534, Henry and Parliament declared the act of supremacy, and, the, and England broke away from the, the Catholic Church. And Anne soon gave birth to Mary's half-sister, Elizabeth. And after Catherine's death, Henry in turn executes Anne Boleyn on trumped-up charges of adultery and conspiracy. I mean, this sounds like a, you know, a, a program on TV that you shouldn't be watching. And it was always for failing to produce a boy, unknowing at that point in time that he's the problem. It's not even the women. His next wife, Jane Seymour, finally gives birth to his long-desired heir, 
uh, Edward VI, and he takes the throne, and he ascends at nine years old, which his guardians over him, and the guardians happen to be Protestants. And they all teach him well. And Edward reverses all of the vestiges of Catholic favor and the laws, and the Reformation officially begins in, in England. And because of this, John Rogers then comes to help. He's, he's known by Thomas Cranmer. He's, he's known by others as Thomas Matthew. So he kind of comes out of the shadows, and he's given the responsibility to preach. And the, the Reformation is underway. And he becomes the victor of St. Margaret's Church in London, and he becomes the preacher at... Uh, St. Sepulchre in London. In 1551, he's a, uh, Rogers is actually appointed the, by the Bishop of London, who is Nicholas Ridley, to be one of his own personal chaplains, which places Rogers in the upper echelon of, of the religion in England. And he's preaching in St. Paul's Cathedral in, in London, and there he preaches the Bible. And he denounces greed shown by... By the clergy, he preached against the Pope and his foul doctrines. He even declined to wear the prescribed uh, vestments, wearing only a simple round cap. Sadly, though, King Edward uh, only lived about six to seven years as king. So he dies at 15 from uh, tuberculosis after contracting measles. Turmoil then ensues, uh, ensued for the throne there was an attempt by, by the Protestants to put uh, Lady Jane Grey up as the, the nine-day queen on the throne, but Mary, Henry's original daughter, early daughter, with overwhelming support because they don't want a civil war, um, wins out. And here's actually a famous painting of her, of her execution. And here is Mary's chance to pay back those that she saw responsible for her mother's humiliation, the Reformers. And so with great hatred of the Protestants because of the annulment of her mother's marriage to Henry, she immediately works to bring England back under the Roman Catholic faith. And she initially did her work by rescinding the religious proclamations of Edward VI and replacing them with old English laws enforcing heresy against the church and Protestant scholars were removed from universities. Protestant pastors were ousted and arrested and stood trial. She, she brought England back under papal authority. And at Westminster Abbey, the mass was celebrated for the first time in, in 20 years. And she just looks like an evil woman, doesn't she? And Rogers is unfazed by her. On, one, uh, on the ascension of Mary to the throne, he preached at Paul's cross, commending the, quote, true doctrine taught in Edward's days, and warning his hearers against, quote, pestilent popery, idolatry, and superstition. Now, you can do that in America, but you can't do that whenever there's a king, or in this case, a queen on, on the throne. I, I mean, it was... It was carrying out her last action that, that earned Mary her nickname. Bloody Mary burned almost 300 Protestants for heresy. And it was here where John Rogers faced her and was victorious. The Tower of London, you can visit it today. It's a modern picture. Some of that's new, but there's the old tower in there. Is where they were held before they were condemned. And many of the figures of history suffered imprisonment in the, in the Bloody Tower. Archbishop Cranmer and Ridley and, and Latimer were condemned to death for heresy in 15, 1555. They were imprisoned in the tower before being burned at the stake at Oxford. These executions were mostly carried out in public places and were witnessed by a large number of, of, of people. And it was intended to do that, to try to strike fear. Here's a picture of Smithfield where the burnings took, took place. However, it had the opposite effect. And according to Fox's account published in 1563, within a decade of the Marian persecution, he said it, it helped light the fire of the Reformed faith. Ten days after preaching a sermon against the papacy after Mary took over, uh, Rogers was summoned by a council 
and bidden to keep within his house. His position was taken away, and his church pulpit was filled by a papist in October. I think that's probably one of the things that hurt him the most. I can't imagine the people at Timberlake, if someone would take me out of the pulpit and put a heretic in there. In January 1554, Bonner, the new Bishop of London, sent him to Newgate Prison where he was confined with John Hooper, Lawrence Saunders, John Bradford, and others for a year. And here's what one histor uh, historian wrote. Quote, he awaited and met death cheerfully, though he was even denied a meeting with his wife. And during his 18 months, John Rogers was held prisoner. While he was held prisoner, he was always cheerful and intent on pushing forward in everything that he undertook. He was tried as a heretic, and when he refused to accept the real presence of Christ at the Mass, he was condemned, and he was burned at the stake February 4th, 1555. That's the field. And the account is recorded by John Fox in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, which you've probably heard of. And here's what that account says. When time came that he should be brought to, uh, out of Newgate to Smithfield, that's to the place of burning, the place of, ex execu the place of his execution, Mr. Woodruff, one of the sheriffs, first came to Mr. Rogers and asked him if he would uh, revoke his uh, abominable doctrine and the evil opinion of the sacrament of the altar. John Rogers answered, That which I have preached I will seal with my blood. Then Mr. Woodruff said, Thou art a heretic. And Rogers responded, That shall be known at the day of judgment. Well, said Mr. Woodruff, I will never pray for thee. Praying for people after they're dead, part of Catholic practice. And Mr. John Rogers said, But I will pray for you. And so he was brought the same day towards Smithfield, saying the Psalm uh, 51, By the way, and all the people wonderfully rejoicing at his constancy. A little before his burning, a pardon was brought, if he would have recanted, but he utterly refused it. His wife and children, being eleven in number, ten able to go, one at her breast, met, met him by the way as he went towards Smithfield. His sorrowful sight of his own flesh and blood could nothing move him, but he constantly and cheerfully took his death with wonderful patience at the defense and quarrel of the gospel of Christ. No eye of the French ambassador who actually witnessed the execution said support was given to Rogers by the greatest part of the people. He said, quote, Even his children assisted him, comforting him in such a manner that seemed as if he had been led to a wedding. And he died over communion. I mean, John Rogers he almost, and almost 300 others died because they denied the practice of the Mass. Because at its most fundamental level, it's blasphemous. It denies Christ alone as a substitute and a sacrifice. It declares that Jesus' death is not enough. What happened on the cross is not enough. You need, you need a, a perpetual sacrifice. That's why you see on, on a Catholic cross a Jesus there. And he's in heaven with the wound still on him. His blood still flows to you that the priest calls down and, and, and ministers a, a sacrifice afresh on the Roman altar at the Mass. It says that his death is on the cross was needed, but it was, but it was incomplete. And now a, a priest must perform a, math, uh, perform a Mass. I mean, uh, Catholic dogma teaches that when the priest pronounces the, the, ho the hocest corpus mehum, which means this is my body in Latin, that the bread supernaturally becomes literally the body of Christ in the, in the cup, the literal blood that flows from his side in heaven. And in Roger's day, whenever a priest would say those words, nobody understood Latin, so it sounded like hocus pocus. And so many believe that's where the origin of that phrase comes from, as if it was a magician doing a trick. The problem is that you have Jesus in multiple places. If he's in heaven and he's on a Roman altar, then, then, then you deny some fundamental doctrines. You deny Christ's human nature. You deny his bodily resurrection. And when 
someone partakes of the mass, they're literally eating the flesh of Jesus and literally drinking his blood. That's why Catholic dogma literally teaches these things about the mass. That's why the elements become literal. The literal presence of Christ at the mass because it's a real sacrifice. It's not a symbol. It's not a worship. It's not a worship servant about, about the sacrifice that happened on the cross. And get this, those additional sacrifices, participating in those additional sacrifices, are necessary for you to, to make it to heaven. I mean, the sacrifices grant you increments of, of grace that kind of leak out, if you will, over, over life after original sin is taken away. And when your life is all added up, then, then if that's the case, you die in a state of grace, you get to go to purgatory and purge off, purgatory, purge off your remaining sins so you can get into heaven. It's the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. It's the antithesis of the sacrifice of Christ once for all on the cross. It's heretical. It's damnable. And if you believe it, you'll not see the kingdom of heaven, and John Rogers knew that. And that's why these people went to, went to the fire. They understood theology that was hiding behind the practice and the elements. J.C. Ryle, I think, said it best. Let me close with, with this. He said, grant for a moment that the Lord's Supper is a sacrifice and not a sacrament. Grant what the masses, they're, they're, they're saying is true. Grant every time the words of consecration are used, the natural body and blood of Christ are present on the communion table under the forms of bread and wine. Grant that everyone who eats the consecrated bread and drinks the consecrated wine does really eat the, and drink the, nat, the natural body and blood of Christ. Grant for a moment these things and then see what monumentous consequences result from, the, from these premises. Number one, you, sto you spoil the blessed doctrine of Christ's finished work. I mean, when he died on the cross, if a sacrifice needs repeated, it's not perfect. It's not completed. Number two, you spoil the priestly office of Christ. If there are priests that can offer an acceptable sacrifice besides God, then the high priest is robbed of his glory. Three, you spoil the scriptural doctrine of Christian ministry. You exalt sinful men into a position of mediators between God and man, which is what a, a priest is. You give to the sacramental elements of bread and wine honor and veneration that they're never meant to, to receive. It produces idolatry of worshiping elements. And number five, last but not least, you overthrow the, the true doctrine of Christ's human nature if... If the body born of the Virgin Mary can be in more than one place at one time, it's not a body like our own, and Jesus was not the, the last Adam in truth of our nature. And J.C. Ryle, speaking of these martyrs, said, Wherever the English language is spoken on the face of the globe, this fact ought to be clearly understood by every Englishman who reads history, rather than admit the doctrine of the real presence of Christ's natural body and blood under the forms of bread and wine. The reformers of the Church of England were content to be burned. And today, there hangs a plaque in England at the very place where Rogers was burned. Interestingly, it's a plaque that hangs on, out, on, on the wall outside of St. Bartholomew's Hospital where Martin Lloyd-Jones practiced medicine before ministry. And so let me bring you back to where we, we, we started. Paul told Timothy, take pains with these things or practice these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident be, before all. Biblical practice flows out of biblical fidelity. So what would you die for? You'd be before you would ever consider that, you would have to take pains to know sound doctrine and then work it out in, in, in life. You can't neglect that work. You can't be laissez faire about that work. Or have a questionable commitment. It has to be pursued with, with vigor. You must take pains to know the Bible but to be so given to it that you understand how to faithfully practice what it says, you have to be totally committed to biblical practice. Gauge it with your mind, practice it with your life and until it lays complete hold of you. Your theology has to be dri driven by your, or sorry, your methodology has to be driven by your, your theology. And if you do, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus.
And I trust you were encouraged and emboldened by the life of John Rogers. Let me pray. Lord, I do thank you for such a fire hydrant of information. But I do pray that what we took away is truth matters. It matters for life and ministry. It, it matters for methodology. And I do pray that you would help us to be faithful to the truth not just what we read and say, but that we would close that biblical integrity gap. It would, it would turn into how we live our life. And I thank you for John Rogers and his testimony to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.